Good evening. At this time, we'd like to convene the um, Palo Alto F City Council Finance Committee meeting for Tuesday, March 7th, 2023. Would the clerk please call the roll? Chair Burt? Here. Councilmember Lifkoff Haynes? Here. Councilmember Stone? Here. I'm to be present. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so tonight we have um, on the agenda. Uh, four different action items after we will soon have a uh, public comment on non-agendized items, but just to uh, be clear on what we have ahead of us, uh, 2024 water utility financial plan, the 2024 wastewater collection utility financial plan, the storm and surface water uh, drainage uh, uh, plan, and the electric utility construction services contract with VIP Powerline. So our first item is actually for public comment uh, where the public is welcome to speak on any items be under the purview of this committee uh, that are not otherwise on the agenda. And do we have any speakers uh, who wish to speak on public comment? Uh, Chair, we do one request. One moment, please. Okay. John Kelly, if you're there, you can speak. Thank you very much, Chair Burt, uh, committee members. I would like to ask the committee and city staff, and I, basically I want to return to something that I said to the city council, I think it was three or four weeks ago. In early February, the Daily Post reported about the knowledge of a $40 million surplus that, in my estimation, was not communicated clearly to the public prior to the vote on Measure K last fall. And there was also a colloquy between Council Member Tanaka, the city manager, and other members of city staff about this issue, either at that or at a subsequent meeting. And I would simply like to ask the question again, whether the city manager, other members of city staff, the finance committee, or the city council has done anything to investigate this matter and to report back to the community in a public and meaningful way, what was known, when was it known, to whom was it known, and what the current status of that surplus is. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, without um, being able to address matters that just uh, that are not on the agenda, I would encourage uh, Mr. Kelly and other members of the public that actually much of that is already answered in the public record from meetings um, preceding, council meetings preceding November 6th. And on that note, uh, our first action item is a resolution approving um, the fiscal year 2024 water utility financial plan and other related matters. Um, and who from staff uh, would like to kick off the presentation? So good evening, Chair Bird, Council members, Dean Bachelor, Utility Director. So as you mentioned, uh, we're coming to you with four items tonight, three of them from the utility side and one from the public works. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jonathan Amagine, who is our Assistant Director for our Resource Planning Group, um, which will um, start off the presentation and then turn it over to Lisa Belair, our, our Senior Resource um, Planner, uh, to actually get into the details the first two items. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jonathan. Thank you, Dean. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, so I'm Jonathan Abenshine, Assistant Director, and uh, good evening, Council members. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of all of, of what's happened with all four of our utilities this year, um, just as uh, as a preview to provide context for your discussions on water, wastewater, and, and storm drain tonight. Um, but uh, obviously, we will be here electric and gas on March 21st, and so the discussion for those uh, utilities will happen on March 21st. Um, 
We want to give this overview because there are a re there are various trends that are contributing to increases or decreases across multiple utilities um, that you'll see discussed uh, over and over in different places tonight and then on March 21st. And the story is complicated this year because there are some trends that are increasing rates uh, and there are others that are decreasing them. And so that leads to situations where we might be proposing a rate change on utilities, but we also just want to be clear with people about what they can expect, expect on their utility bills over the next year, because there may actually be some decreases in their overall bill. Uh, before I jump into the um, rate proposals, I just want to talk about the, the trend that's most on people's minds right now. It's the skyrocketing uh, energy prices that occurred this winter. Um, those high energy prices were unprecedented. They were the highest on record. It cost Palo Alto five times as much to buy gas uh, this January as compared to last January. And that's showing up on people's February bills. Um, some of the contributing factors here were um, high demand due to cold weather, uh, low amounts of gas and storage and constraints on supply across the West. Um, there are several investigations going on uh, because these prices still, despite these factors, were significantly higher than we would have expected. Um, so I, I believe there's a FERC investigation going on as well as the California ISO and the CPUC. Um, so we're following those. And uh, we are also looking at what option we can bring back to council to protect against uh, the potential other potential price spikes like this in the future. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so fortunately, um, starting in February, gas and electric market prices have started to decline from the extreme levels uh, of the winter, as have our utility costs, and that's going to start showing up in people's gas bills in March. But as of this hearing, most people, uh, some people have started to receive those those March bills um, and have seen that gas, gas bills have started to come lower. But a lot of those watching right now may really be worrying what's happening with their gas bills over the next few months. And so these are a few important messages we wanted to share. Uh, first off, we expect March gas bills to be less than half of February gas bills. Um, and of course, that's still significantly higher than last year's bills, but we do expect April gas bills to be even lower. I believe it's another 40% lower than March. Uh, based on the prices um, as of March 1st, uh, which are utility costs of the month. And uh, the council is discussing rebates to customers to provide some relief from high winter gas prices this year. Um, I know those discussions were coming. And in the meantime, I, uh, we put on the slide some of the avenues that customers have to seek relief from high winter energy bills. Uh, this is arranging payment plans. For anybody who uh, wants to pay off those bills over 68 months, is also we've also we're also offering free consultations with the city's home efficiency advisor, and we have our rate assistance program and uh, free energy efficiency improvement program to help lower income customers. Uh, some of these programs help retroactively; some are uh, they really just help reduce the burden going forward. Next slide, please. Um, these really high winter gas prices and then the declines that are happening over the next few months are one of several trends that are going to affect people's utility bills in uh, calendar year 2023. They are one of the most impactful. Um, we're going to, as these prices start to decline, these energy prices start to decline, we're going to start passing the supply cost declines through to our monthly, uh, through to the customers, through our monthly gas uh, commodity rate adjuster, and also through expected decreases in the electric utilities hydroelectric rate adjuster. Um, which we would expect in uh, July. We'll talk about that um, on March 21st. Uh, you will see, though, that there are still a lot of upward pressures on rates, um, and we are proposing some rate increases uh, in July. But even with the electric and gas rate increases we're proposing this year, we are expecting that people's electric and gas bills will be lower in FY 2024 than they were in FY 2023. And we want to drive this price, this point home, because the energy price spikes this year have made it complicated to describe what's happening to people's utility bills over the next few months. Um, overall, the story we want to get across is that utility bills are declining from the very high winter levels. They're going to go down over the next few months. There will be some increase in July, but not to the levels seen in winter 2022, in, in winter of this year. These projections are uncertain. I mean, I, I want to acknowledge that 
However, um, and I we have a graph we can show uh, in at our next meeting. These uh, uh, increases in January really were extreme compared to anything we've seen historically. Um, so with that said, I just want to talk about a few more factors driving the proposed July increases. So first off, energy prices are expected to remain elevated going forward, even though they're not going to be at these winter uh, the levels they, we saw this winter. They're also not going to be as low as pre-pandemic levels, according to what we're seeing in the market right now. Uh, both gas and electric transmission costs are rising, as are environmental charges, uh, and those factors continue to push bills up in coming years. Um, the utilities are also recovering from the pandemic. So during the pandemic, we kept rate increases low for multiple years to help customers suffering from the economic impacts of shelter in place. Uh, so all, util all utilities' revenues are currently below costs. Now, we knew this was going to happen when we kept the rate increases low. And we looked ahead and we had planned to phase in the rate increase gradually after the pandemic, um, using reserves to absorb deficits for a few years. But in most utilities at this point, that's no longer possible. So for electric and gas, the winter uh, energy cost spikes were not passed through completely to customers. And the difference was absorbed from reserves. And both of those utilities are well below minimum, at or below minimum uh, in, in those utilities. Wastewater also has an issue with low reserves by the end of FY2023 as well. Next slide, please. Uh, with respect to drought, um, I'm sorry, I had actually intended to update this. Um, this shows drought as an upward pressure rates. I think we changed it for the UAC to reflect, to be determined. Um, there are mixed signals with respect to drought. We won't have a firm sense of its impacts on the electric and water utilities until April. And I know that that can sound, with all the talk about the massive snowpack in Tahoe and all the rains in, in December, that can be a complicated um, uh, and maybe surprising message to hear. Um, but while those winter rains broke records, there hasn't been that much rain since in some of these watersheds. We've been getting some and it's been making progress and the effects were uneven. So for example, they didn't hit the Northern Sierra as much and that's where most of the state's water and most of our, our hydropower comes from. And we still haven't reached average precipitation on an annual basis there yet. I think on average, the Northern watersheds get about 53 inches and uh, we're only looking about 44 inches or 45 inches last I checked uh, today or yesterday. Um, but in the south of the Sierras, where some of our hydropower comes from and most of the Bay Area's water comes from, precipitation is above average for the water year already. Uh, the biggest reservoirs in the state are still at levels below historical average. But on the other hand, there's a lot of snow in the Sierras, um, and that's the state's second reservoir. So that offsets it to some extent. And then there are also other factors that weigh that that factor in here uh, that determine how much water or hydropower we get for snow and rain that include things like how much water gets absorbed into the dry ground, what are the drought regulations this year, environmental regulations that affect water flows, and then allocations of water between water and power users in the Central Valley project. So in general, things are improving, but we're not going to really know until April uh, definitively um, what the impact's going to be. Uh, other factors um, include in the need for increased capital investment uh, due to aging infrastructure. Um, you'll see that in the wastewater discussions tonight. Uh, we also have aging infrastructure in the electric utility and, um, and of course the need to modernize the grid as the community electrifies. And of course, over the last few years, we have seen inflation across the board. Construction inflation remains a difficult challenge for public agencies in the Bay Area. And other types of inflation are affecting all utility costs, including salary and benefit costs. Uh, next slide, please. So this gives an overview of all of our proposals. Um, and I just want to uh, speak to a few things here. Um, first, we included FY 2021 and FY 2022 just to show uh, how much we were able to hold down utility rates and protect the community over those, those years. Um, and then you can see the impact of very high energy prices in FY 2023. Um, <laughs> most notable there is the 37% increase listed for the electric utility. That represents three rate changes. First, in April 2022, the activation of the hydroelectric rate adjuster. In July, the 5% uh, increase to the base rates, and then the increase as of January 1st 
at a hydro rate adjuster from 13 cents at 1.3 cents to uh, 4.8 cents. Um, because of those increases, we're not expecting to need to increase. Uh, um, uh, we're not expecting to, people to see an increase in their electric bills for FY 2024. And in fact, if um, indications continue to improve for the um, uh, for uh, uh, the drought for precipitation, we could even see a decrease. Um, but we are definitely anticipating to decrease the hydroelectric rate adjuster by half or more. Uh, but at the same time, because revenues are so far below cost and reserves are so low, still we're going to need a 14% increase. We're proposing a 14% increase in the electric utility uh, that offsets those decreases. In the gas utility, um, we are showing you the um, rate changes uh, just driven by the changes in distribution rates. So we have our gas supply rates and our distribution rate. The gas supply rates have been so variable that they kind of hide the proposals that we have for the distribution rates if you include them. So we'll talk about that more on March 21st. But right now, uh, I think we, we just want to let you know that we are proposing a distribution increase that would have uh, about an 8% increase on the overall rates. Um, we do still expect that people's bills, gas bills in FY 2024 would be lower than FY 2023 for the reasons I discussed earlier. You'll hear more about 9% wastewater increase and the 7% water proposed increase tonight. Um, so I, I won't talk more about that. In refuse, there are no proposed rate changes. And then in storm drain, we do have a, a CPI rate change uh, proposed. Um, the public the public works department I will be talking about. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to talk through these four slides, but I just wanted you to know that you have your paddock packet. Uh, we do, um, cost containment is important to us as a utility, and um, what we have listed in here in the next slide uh, and the following slide are uh, things that we've done to um, reduce costs in the utility, and in the following slide, uh, what we're planning to do in the future. While these items don't necessarily end up decreasing rates, they do... Uh, reduce the rate of increase in weights, and we consider them very important uh, for that reason. So I'll stop here, and I'll turn it uh, back over to Lisa Belier to talk about the um, water and wastewater, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. So before we go right into the water and wastewater, uh, why don't we see if we have any questions on this uh, informative overview? Um, colleagues, Greer? Great, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for that presentation. That was helpful. I really liked seeing projected change in residential medium bills because that was be one of my questions. Though I was, I'm, I may have missed it. So for fiscal year 2024, the bottom it says five percent total total monthly bill change. But you then mentioned is that more eight percent? So can you just go over that again? I mean, yeah. I so um, all of the different utilities contribute to the. Uh, the um, residential bill in different amounts. Um, so the electric makes a, a smaller contribution. Uh, water can make a larger contribution. So one percent increase in one utility might not have will have a different impact on the overall utility bill for the customer. So that at bottom shows how much when people hold that entire bill in their hands, how much they can expect that to increase um, from June to July or you know, from fiscal year 2023 to fiscal year 2024. So uh, it's 5%, a 5% increase on the median residential bill. And I would say that when you take into account the expected decreases in gas supply costs, probably in the ballpark of three to 5%. Uh, okay, thank you. I don't know why I heard the 8% then. So I'm glad you clarified that. So total projected increases across all utilities through fiscal year 2028 looks like likely anticipated to be less than CPI increases per year? You say that? Uh, it depends on what CPI ends up being over the next right. few years, but it's in, it's, it's in that ballpark. In the ballpark. Yeah. Okay. Um, and do you know, best of on to, to gas rates, do you know how the, those compare to other jurisdictions in California? I don't know yeah. if you saw, but also, and, and for my colleagues as well, the Mercury today published, a, had, a, had an article on... On um, 
how much California rel relies on imported natural gas and some of the reasons behind some of those gas rate spikes and, and maybe a, a part of, um, yeah, I think everyone's frustrated by those changes, but would be helpful for the, for the public to be able to know, you know how much is this because of, of Palo Alto and how much of this is just because of the, of the market that Palo Alto has no control over. Yeah, I, I, these these increases, um, and it really was January. Um, in January, that the I, I have a slide that I wish I could show you um, that shows the spike, and I'll show it to you at the next meeting. But um, it this these increases happened across the West. They were more pronounced in California, but prices were hitting uh, three dollars to four dollars a therm in many places outside, even outside of California. Um, nearly every utility in California experienced the same increases. Um, I was charting uh, Palo Alto's rates against SDG&E, SoCal Gas, PG&E. Everybody um, saw those, those extreme increases in January in lockstep, except PG&E. Um, I don't know, we, we don't know the reasons that Palo, that, uh, Palo Alto's rates rose or above PG&E's um, for that month. But I can tell you that for February, um, uh, Palo Alto's rates went back to being significantly low, lower than um, uh, PG&E's by somewhere in the ballpark of 20%. Now, uh, average over the year, you know, we, we're often in the 5% to 10% below PG&E for our residential rates, um, but uh, it has been volatile over the winter. But I can say that this is a West-wide issue. It's been a California-wide issue, and that's all been reflected in the <clears throat> um, the call for, I think, investigations by the CPC, Cal ISO, and uh, Federal Electric Regulatory Commission to see if there's anything more uh, to this than, um, than, uh, um, than just fundamental factors, whether it's any market manipulation. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I'll hold off on my water utility questions until after that presentation, see if there, those questions are answered. Julie? Thank you. Pat. Um, hello, everyone. I'm new to the Finance Committee. Delighted to be here. Also new to utility stuff. I'm excited to learn. Um, I am having trouble with the um, hydroelectric rate adjuster concept. I um, could probably go somewhere and get a primer on what that means. But if somebody could give me like the the brief overview on what that is, what it does, why it matters. Clearly it does, but yeah. I don't understand it. So I'll, I'll give that to you in just a, a, a sentence or two, but we'll be able to dig more deeply into that on March 21st. And I'm also happy to answer questions offline as well. Um, so the hydroelectric rate adjuster is a, a rate adjuster that's activated when our, um, when we see persistent continuing low hydroelectric generation due to drought, this increase, uh, this low generation or hydroelectric resources can increase our overall costs. We try to absorb that from reserves, and we are usually able to do that for a couple of years. But when drought lasts for a really extended period, um, the reserves become exhausted, and we end up needing a temporary rate adjuster in place um, to recover those additional costs. Thank you. That's very helpful. Let, let me try to add on to that. Um, John, correct me if I get any of this wrong, but basically we have two large hydro contracts that we're part of with Northern California Power Authority. And we we have nearly fixed costs for those contracts, uh, regardless of how much hydropower is generated. So in wet years, we're producing a lot of electricity on the same cost in, in drought years. Our costs stay almost the same, but we get a lot less electricity, and therefore, the cost per watt goes up a lot. Is that roughly correct, John? Yeah, that's that's dead on. And um, and I'll just add that during those years, that's when we try to restore those reserves that we use to carry us through the dry years. Um, we just end up having to use the ester during an extended drought, like we've been experience, experiencing. And just as a follow up to that, can you refresh us on um, which reservoirs or um, sections of the state we have on our two big hydro contracts that we share in? 
Yeah, most of the hydroelectric power, uh, most of the, the, the large reservoirs are from the um, uh, uh, Lake Shasta. Um, so in that northern uh, in that northern part of the state, um, and um, and then there are several smaller uh, hydroelectric generators as well um, through other parts of the state as well. The Calaveras Group is that essentially so a Calaveras? Calaveras group? is our second hydroelectric resource, right. and that was developed uh, by um, Northern California Power Agency, which is the joint powers agency we belong to with other public power utilities, and that is uh, entirely reserved for we us for for the for those power public power utilities that developed it. Whereas the Central Valley Project has a lot of different stakeholders going well beyond power producers. Uh, and that is a significantly smaller um, part of our, is about a third of the generation of um, what we get from the Central Valley Project. But yes, Calaveras is in that Southern Sierra watershed. Um, and, uh, and and so it's, it's getting significantly more snowpack. Um, thanks. And uh, that two thirds, one third uh, is a real helpful clarification, as you noted. Uh, the far north of Trinity and Shasta reservoirs have not to date received the super heavy um, rainfall that we've had uh, in the um, the northern Sierra, the uh, central and the southern Sierra. Um, the it, it certainly looks that not only from the rainfall that we've received date, but what is projected for the balance of March at a minimum um, that the Sierra, which you know, just is not technically part of the Sierra, and this uh, this year uh, to date has been getting bypassed on the most severe storms. Although the the projections for this next set um, are are scheduled to hit that area harder, and we hope so. Um, but the Sierra is is very chance it's going to approach um, the highest uh, precipitation in seventy years um, with now what we're seeing on the horizon. And that certainly affects our water resources and then affects one third of our uh, electric hydro resources. Um, so that will be very interesting uh, to monitor. Um, and thanks also for that kind of overview on the comparison versus PG&E on the gas rates, because uh, that's been one question that we to date haven't really been providing our public when we had a month or two where we went from traditionally below PG&E gas rates to above. And I hadn't heard until tonight that we are now back below in this whole volatile period. Uh, that's good news. Um, but I, I, I'm looking forward to uh, two weeks getting the, the deeper dive explanation of what affected PG&E versus what affected us and what we all have in common in kind of the California and the Western US. Um, so that would be very important as well. Last thing is um, when we look at the, on your slide seven, I think. Um, yeah, this one, sorry that we have in front of us. Um, when we look at a 5% increase for this year, that's 5% on top of the 2023 rates which, if I understand them correctly, include these big spikes, both the e-hydro increases and the unanticipated gas spike. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a momentary technical issue here. Um, yes, that is correct. Uh, however, what I will say is that um, uh, yeah, so it is a, it is a five percent increase overall on the FY twenty twenty three bill. It does include all of those changes. And I, what, what I will say is though that the decline in gas rates and, and potential electric uh, de decline in the electric hydroelectric rate adjuster is not reflected there. So I'd say it's probably more like a three percent to five percent increase. That's good to hear. Um, and and I was struggling with this graph or the table only shows a 4% gas rate increase. Can you explain why it, it's only 4% with that uh, big spike that we've had in the winter? Yeah, um, so it's because this line 
right now only reflects the um, the change um, that's caused by increases in the distribution rates. So, so it doesn't factor in gas supply at all. And what we'll show you on March 21st is what that same chart looks like with the gas supply included. And you see really significant increases in FY 2023 and then a decrease, really significant decrease in FY 2024, if you do it that way. We didn't show it that way on this chart, because it makes it very hard to see what our actual rate proposal is. Okay, um, that's informative. I This chart way it's labeled doesn't imply that. Yeah. Uh, and I think for the public, um, that would be important to make that distinction that you just described. Okay, uh, on that note, let's go ahead and um, have Lisa provide the updates on the water utility. Thank you so much. My name is Lisa Belier, Acting Senior Resource Planner in the Utilities Department, and I'd like to talk to you about the water utility. Um, and I'm going to hit some of the highlights of the slides so that there'll be more time to focus on any questions that you may have. For the water utility, the overall increase is a 7% increase, and there's two components of that increase. One is a 3% distribution rate increase, which increases the distribution rates that pay for the distribution system in Palo Alto to maintain, and, uh, um, to maintain the system and the infrastructure. The second component is an 11.6% projected increase in the commodity rate, which is the... Um, to the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, who provides all of the potable water to the city of Palo Alto. And uh, that is a pass-through rate. And it's a projection right now, but we will know the final rate increase proposal in May. And then we will provide notice to customers and pass that rate increase expected uh, July 1st. So that will bring the price per CCF from the current rate of $4.75 up to the $5.30 listed on the slide. The water utility has healthy reserves, and uh, we are planning as part of this rate proposal to utilize those reserves together with the rate increases in order to reduce the need for the rate increase. So that's how we uh, managed to pose the 3% incre uh, distribution increase in 2024. Uh, the overall increase in the next subsequent four years is between 3 and 5% annually. Uh, and I wanted to also say that in order to utilize the funding in the rate stabilization reserve, we're proposing a $3 million transfer from the rate stabilization reserve to the operations reserve this year, uh, and a $3.7 million transfer from the CIP reserve to the operations reserve. So that CIP reserve transfer will pay for the needed infrastructure upgrades, including the uh, uh, including some of the upgrades on some of the reservoirs for seismic reasons, the rate stabilization transfer will serve to stabilize the rates and reduce the need to increase the rates. And I wanted to touch on, there's three reasons that SFPUC is proposing to increase the commodity rate. And those are uh, increased capital spending, which will increase their debt service that we'll need to be paying for. The second is they had a large balancing account owed to wholesale customers, including Palo Alto. By the end of this fiscal year, that balancing account will be exhausted. So there will be not, no funding left to blunt any rate increases needed. And the third reason is that uh, their projections for the region in terms of the amount of uh, water being sold are still depressed from the drought, from the drought impacts. This chart shows the costs and revenue for the water utility. The, the bar, the, the stacked bars show the costs and you can see the blue bars show the water supply. Those are the commodity costs that I was mentioning increasing in 2023 and 2024. The uh, great green and green bars show the operations costs increasing over time and those are primarily driven by salary and benefit increases and then the orange bars are staying relatively consistent over the projected years you can see the blue line is the revenue and it's going down and it went down in 2022 with reduced sales during a drought and we're projecting that it'll remain down in 2023 and slowly recover over time um, and you can see that the cost bars are well above the revenue, and that's because of this 
a proposal that I mentioned to you where we're utilizing those reserves in order to reduce the need to increase rates in the short term. And the proposal is the 7%. That's the first red number listed above fiscal year 2024. The operations reserve and CIP reserve will remain within the guideline under this projection throughout the forecast period. And so with that, I'm going to jump to the recommendation. Um, it's not letting me jump there, but I'm going to go to the recommendation. And I wanted to mention that we did bring this proposal to the UAC last Wednesday, and the UAC unanimously supported the staff proposal. And it it what's listed on the slide is we're requesting a resolution for adopting the financial plan, the $3.7 million transfer from the CIP reserve to the operations reserve, the $3 million transfer that I mentioned from the rate stabilization reserve to the operations reserve, and the uh, rate increase in the schedules that we've presented. And with that, I'd be happy to go to any areas that you have questions on. Thank you. Um, Greer? Thanks. Thanks for the report. The, the report state the seven staff report stated that water revenues down because of customer response to water conservation calls. So does that mean that the efforts kind of regionally and here in the city really actually work for those conservation? Because I just I remember it wasn't just a few months ago that there was great concern that customers were not responding adequately to to these calls for uh, water conservation. Because so you kind of speak to that. Yes, regionally in the last year, there was an overall uh, reduction. I think the regional number is about 11%, which is what in line with what SFPUC was calling for. Um, in San Francisco, in the city of San Francisco, for their retail customers, they actually reduced a little bit more than the wholesale customers as a whole. In I think in Palo Alto specifically in the first six months of last year, we didn't, uh, the community didn't reduce as much as a whole as what we had uh, requested or hoped for. That was primarily driven, I think, because of the dry weather in the first part of the year. But when the, during the second part of the year, after the council implemented water use restriction policies, including the two day per week watering, uh, the community really achieved a lot of reduction in the second half of the year in line with the request uh with the with the desired reductions of about 11 percent which was the call from sfpuc okay well, I'm, I'm glad people finally heard the emergency call and, and and responded to it i i i would imagine that given that we've been in a drought for so long and that we've all been so so used to hearing these calls for conservation that I, I can see it being a little longer for people to start redirecting their habits and going back to non-drought year behavior. So glad to see it looks like we're kind of doing a more um, cautious approach, but it'll be interesting to see how behaviors change because I can't recall the last time we were coming out of such a major, major drought. Um, do customers see, so, uh, so with the bill pass through of the bill portion through the SFPUC, do customers see... Do they see that number that's associated with the SFPUC uh, rate, or is it just all lumped into one single water utility rate? They they do um, the rate schedules list out the amount the the four dollars and seventy five cents, um, and they're. Uh, and it is separated out on the bill. You can see the commodity charge on the bill. Okay, okay, that's good. And then, okay, again, this chart helps understand better um, on, on, sorry, on, on the aggregate. Um, so going to uh, table seven on the staff report, you know, packet page 12, it showed estimated monthly bill. And then below that is estimated bill impact. I didn't really understand the difference between those two figures. Okay, I'm with you at table seven. Table seven. Sorry, pulling it up myself here. So, I didn't really, yeah, so I just didn't understand. It has an estimated monthly bill, and then it says estimated monthly bill impact, and then it says dollar per month. What, right. What, what is that? Can you explain the difference between those two? Yeah, thank you for that question. Difference. So the the monthly, the estimated monthly bill, this, 
could have been labeled better. So we'll try to strive to improve the labeling. Um, but the monthly bill is supposed to, is showing the, the increase in the year from the year prior to the okay. increase. So this, this increase is about uh, $6.60 is what it amounts to. The 7% overall rate increase will affect a residential customer by about $6.60 in fiscal year 2024. Gotcha. Um, and then the overall bill impact row is supposed to be indicating the difference between the median monthly bill in 2023 and then what that median monthly bill will be in 2024. Okay. So FY 2023 would be 10506 minus 660. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That makes sense. And then just one final question. So our water rates are designed to really kind of just recover the city's costs associated with water distribution and to maintain adequate financial reserves. Uh, that seems to be the goal of these rates. That's exactly correct. Okay. And so what are, I, I, I wasn't able to say like, what are the current financial reserves? Um, yeah. If you the monetary amount, do you know where to direct yeah, me to on that one? If you go to the financial plan, you can look at the table. I think it's Appendix B at the back of the financial plan. It's in if you look in the staff report, it's a linked document, is what's ah, called. Okay. So it says financial those. plan linked document. Um at the end of fiscal year 2022, there was about $14 million in the operations reserve, $9 million in the rate stabilization reserve, and $10.7 million in the CIP reserve. So that's kind of the total. Uh, but if you look at the financial plan, you can see that in the table appendix B. And do we have a council policy on where those reserves should be? Yes, each of the reserves have a policy, and it's stated in the back of the financial plan. There's a, a guideline. So as part of this resolution, the the council would actually be kind of uh, okaying that version of the policy that's included in the financial plan, and there's no change in it from the previous year. Great. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, so much. Um, I'm wrestling with the tension between the uh, desire to conserve water for reasons of ecology and sustainability and climate, and yet we need the revenue from water sales. And I'm just curious about how we balance this in our thinking and our prioritizing. In particular, I noted that there's this drought surcharge and curious as to how we narrate it to lay people to to the average Palo Alto. It looks like people are effectively paying for water we have told them they can't use. And so I just love a sense of how we balance these things and speak about them. So what I'd say right now is that we there is a placeholder on the rate schedules for the drought surcharge, but we're not charging the drought surcharge and we're not planning to charge the drought surcharge during this drought. What the activity that's happening right now is we are uh, returning to the drought surcharge calculation with a consultant and working on revising that calculation so that it will be ready when we uh, enter into a another drought or in case this drought continues. Okay. And to the larger tension of we provide water as utility and water is not um, in great use, we sort of have to accommodate that. Help me understand that. How do we think about that? How do we think about the future of water? Okay, you want to say something? That's a great question. Carla Daly, um, acting assistant director. It um so the it, it is a tricky message when we do need to implement the drought surcharge. Um, and it really is not a it's not a tool for getting people to conserve more. It is a revenue, um, it's a mechanism to make up for the lost revenue. And part of the message that we that we try to communicate is that even though uh, folks end up paying more per unit of water that they consume, that their bill should be lower if they are conserving water. So that's that's the message that we try and get out there. But it is a, it is a tricky one. Yeah. And a lot of people are, you know, let me have questions about that when we when do Thank you. To implement surcharge. My next question is: I was struck by the fact that fire services seem to get quite a big in cost for the same meter size, and I'm wondering if that is just a matter of public policy or if I'm missing something in uh, trying to analyze these numbers.
Um, could you sh tell me where you're seeing that? Um, those. See if I can find where I've seen it. Let's see. And let me give it a try to that those that is a service that is very rarely used. Okay. It's really for the case of having to put out a fire. And so that charge is more or less to re reserve capacity if it's needed, but it is it's a very, very small amount of water. So okay. I was looking at table three and four, I guess. Um the current and proposed monthly service charges for W4 and W7 versus current and proposed for fire services W3, and just looking at the size of the meters, the the amount of water you get presumably is the same if the meter is the same size, but there, so the fire folks are being charged a lot less. It's it's really more of a, um, a, a ready to serve charge in the event that it's needed. It's okay. really not used. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Um, so a uh, couple of ones, uh, Carla, you had mentioned this importance of conveying to the public that uh, when we have conservation, whether it's uh, and use less water or uh, use less gas or electricity uh, or create less uh, solid waste uh, that is landfill versus uh, what's recycled. Um, we have uh, a common perception uh, that by residents that penalizing me for conserving. And as you stated, uh, what we see is that if if I have a 10% increase in my water costs per gallon, but I use 10% less water, my bill didn't go up. And for a long while, um, uh, I felt that we, we don't highlight that well enough. And I'm glad they pointed it out. And I just want to encourage as we go forward with this, this year in particular, after these big spikes, that we, we put that context out there, uh, as a reminder. Um, and, uh, it, it stating at one time won't really get it through to everyone, uh, connected with that. Uh, we also see over time uh, a great concern that uh, our how can we have significantly new housing development when we have the state uh, uh, looking at uh, drought periods or even just a limited long-term supply of water, uh, regardless of the fluctuations from drought and surplus periods. And when we look at our long-term usage of water, and for that matter, gas and electric, uh, they have been on very significant declines over time, even with growth. And we periodically get those graphs, but putting them front and center again, I think is an extremely important message to the community that we have seen our water use decline, what, 40% over the last 20 something years, depending on whether it's a drought year or not. Um, how we have had growth. Some of that is because we have had uh, fewer industrial users, but that really happened 20, 30 years ago. That's not such a recent phenomena. And so through all the measures of, of having uh, wiser, uh, uh, more constrained shower heads to drip irrigation, to replacing uh, turf areas in our homes with natural vegetation, all of that has shown a steady, steady, steady decline in water use. Then the other message, if if that's true, the resident says, well, why am I being asked to conserve so much in a drought? And uh, certainly part of the answer to that is that we have these fluctuations and we're going to have even more extreme fluctuations in with climate change between heavy rainfall periods and drought periods. And that volatility, volatility is projected to become even more exacerbated over time and a real management problem of, of our supplies. But there's one other dimension that we need to remind the public of. And that is that we many of the drought restrictions are imposed at a statewide level. 
And some of them are through our local, our supplier of San Francisco's PUC. We are we call it our Hetch Hetchy water, although it's multiple reservoirs. Um, and so they have their own to conserve water in a, a prolonged drought period, like we have, I will say not that we're not just emerging from, we have emerged from, and I'm going to be prepared to take that position. Um, uh, but um, but the Hetch Hetchy system is probably in the best situation of any water system in the state on an ongoing basis. Uh, and the reason for that is that 20 or so years ago, up until then, in droughts, San Francisco gets hydroelectric power and water from the Hetch Hetchy system, whereas all of the rest of us in Bosca, the, their customer base, get just water. And in drought years, San Francisco was continuing to pump water out of the reservoirs that we needed for water supply, and they were pumping it out in a drought to produce cheap hydro. And that policy changed. And that's when we went from having periods in a drought where Hetch Hetchy's water volume would get precariously low to a period where it's really uh, as good as any system in the state. And we're paying for that. You know, we get both highest water quality, but we also now have less risk of inadequate water supply than almost any water system in the state. And that's part of the story that we need to convey to our ratepayers. Um, so there's several high-level messages, and but I think there are things that people can understand if we put them clearly and uh, repeatedly, and they'll, they'll get it better than they do today. So I really encourage us to do that. Um, then I, I know that the, um, the reserves for water and otherwise are in these linked long-term financial plans. Um, that's a, an extensive document. It's linked in our reports. I would encourage extracting key tables on those reserves and putting them in the actual report to the council uh, and the public. And we won't need to read that whole financial plan, although it's available to us, but that that's a key component that's driving that. And as well as, uh, uh, Lisa, you kind of touched on how these reserves are actually, we have multiple reserves, and we make decisions to say, well, one reserve is above our target, and another reserve is below, and we actually have fungibility between those reserves. We can make a policy decision to move funds from one surplus reserve to one that's in shortage uh, in a given year, and to put that out clearly for the council and the public as well, so that we really understand what are these moving pieces, and that they're not being moved behind the curtain. It's right out in front. Here's what we're doing and why. Um, so then the last thing, the more substantive thing that I wanted to uh, go forward on is we have on slide 17, as you were pointing out, these differences in water supply. And I think you said that the projection is not much of an increase in consumption this coming fiscal year uh, because we're still in this transition between a drought period and a normal period. First, I when I see on this table, it FY24 does look like a significant increase in water supply. And we don't have the actual um, table numbers, but um, am I misreading that? Or what is the water the projection in water supply between the fiscal year we're in right now and the coming one. You are right. I, I thought if I said that it was not a big increase, uh, I misspoke. It okay. is a significant increase. Okay. There's a price increase uh, that SFP is project SFPUC is projecting at 11.6 percent per unit, um, and so that's reflected in the bar going from the 2023 to 2024. And so out of that 11.6 percent, you had said a portion of that's the capital spending. Yes. And, um, you know, we've had a whole number of years where this whole Hetch Hetchy transmission system has been rebuilt. Is that part of that ongoing investment? 
It is part of it. Yes. So, and then how much of the uh, eleven point six percent commodity rate increase is tied to the water use projections, and and what are what are they currently projecting at SFPUC? And 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 lastly, when did they last make those projections? The latest projection that we have from them is from mid February. Um, I do not have a breakdown like by percentage of what portion of the 11.6% comes from which of those three sources, but they've divided those as the top three drivers. Um, and I can try to find out. That would be helpful. Which, what the percentage breakdown is. And the reason I'm pushing on that is because I appreciate that agencies, including SFPUC, and to a degree ourselves, are um, uh, institutionally conservative in projections. Um, and that includes that when we're pivoting from a severe drought to what may be a significant surplus in water. I actually uh, think that for the Hetch Hetchy system, um, we're liable to see just at capacity in the coming months. Uh, we not only have this southern and this in the northern part of the southern Sierras, that system. Um, uh, we not only have 200 plus percent of normal, uh, and we have weeks ahead of us of what looks like extremely wet conditions for the second half of March. Uh, and you put those things compounded and we are likely to have very full reservoirs there. As we talked about earlier, Northern Sierra, or actually the, the Shasta and, and uh, Trinity area, uh, which is not truly Sierra, is in a different boat. But these reservoirs of Pardee, um, uh, Elnor Pardee, um, of, uh, uh, of um, Cherry Lake, Hetch Hetchy, and then downstream uh, Don Pedro, uh, that's set of reservoirs that make the Hetch Hetchy system are liable to be just packed. And even though SFPUC has not yet acknowledged that change, I mean, mid-February, it was still things are promising, but let's be conservative. By early March, geez, it's, it's, it's even more solid. By the, unless suddenly we get the next couple of weeks of a drastic change from what is being forecast, it's a gangbuster water year. And we may have more problems with ability to store water than we have problems with having enough water. So that all leads to my hesitancy to include a uh, the portion of the commodity rate increase that is attributed to water use projections uh, still being uh, anything retarded due to water supply limitations, I'm hesitant to build that into our race, even if SFPUC has not given us the green light. Yeah, I would just add to that, that it really is sales that drive these rates. And you kind of started to um, allude to that in the last part of your comments. And as we've seen in our own water sales, for better or for worse, it takes a while for people to start using more water again and again it's that tension between conserving and, and sales and so um even with a full system that doesn't mean people go back to using well that's water right exactly right Our, when we get in patterns of conserving water uh it takes us a little while to adjust to normal again uh, it's exactly true um that's a good point um so then it, it it's a question of how much of that projection that SFPUC is making on water use projections is based upon inhibited demand versus um, constraining, expecting that constraints on supply will inhibit that demand. And I don't know the answer to that, uh, but we have both factors. Um, we're going to have a lot of water this year available. Okay. That's a a lot of, and as we all talk, these are this is a convergence of a lot of different factors go into these rates. Um, so you had said that basically we're mitigating that increase 
uh, by also um, using our reserves. Is, did I understand that right? Yes, that's correct. We're proposing to use it. So just to clarify, when you say that increase, the proposed increase, the proposed increase on all, all that we could do is mitigate the distribution increase with the reserve, with the reserves. So we're trying to, what we can, what the council can approve is the uh, distribution rate increase. So what I'm trying to say is that we're trying to limit that distribution increase by using the reserves that are available in the different reserves that I mentioned. That's So we can't use a reserve to mitigate the projected commodity cost increase. Actually, I guess we could. We could try to do that. Yeah, we could uh, use reserves and pay for our costs of the purchase water. So can you give us an overview of where we are on those reserves? I know it's in the long-term forecast, but where yes, do we stand on those? I can reserves? show you the charts of the CAP reserve and the operations reserve. Great. So this is the operations reserve, and you can see that at the end of fiscal year 22, it's uh, at the top of the guideline range. And then throughout the forecast period, it remains within the range, but does dip down closer to the minimum. So that's the operations reserve. And then the CIP reserve is here. And you can see that, uh, again, at the end of fiscal year 2022, it's close to the top of the guideline range. And uh, it begins to decline as we have some infrastructure projects, and it goes up and down as we do this uh, every other year main replacement strategy to try to make our main replacement projects uh, large in the in ever in the even years. So that's why that fluctuates up and down, but remains within the guideline range throughout the period. So, if we were willing to try to further mitigate the uh, water rate increases by utilizing a bit more of our reserves. Um, uh, the the capital reserve um, is way above the, uh, well, let's see, that says min max guideline, but I is that a min or a max? The max is the one at the top, and the I min see. is the one at the bottom. Oh, okay. But you're, the bars, they yeah. don't have a different color, so yeah. Yep, yep. No, Sorry if that's it. confusing. Um, so we we would be dipping close to the min, the way in I, fiscal year twenty six. That's right. And twenty four. And in twenty twenty four. Yes. Yeah. So twenty four is the one we're looking at, and that was the one that I was hoping we might have some ability to go further, but we don't want to get too close to our min. Right. But what I haven't shown you is a chart of the rate stabilization reserve that okay. currently has $9 million in it. So this proposal would be to take $3 million out each year for the next three years in order to uh, reduce the amount of rate increases needed. So you could use it more quickly, but then you'd have larger rate increases in the future. That's certainly That's an option. Assuming that, um, that we don't have increased consumption that would mitigate uh, the projected uh, um, cost increase from water use uh, being limited. And, you know, you alluded to how this 11.6% commodity, some proportion of that is based on water use projections. If water use goes up, then um, greater than SFPUC is rejecting, then that would reduce the projected commodity rate increase. Is that correct? We will know that in May, because in April, the SFPUC will make their uh, preliminary projection, or they've already made a preliminary projection. They'll update it in April, and they'll have they'll fi their final hearing in May to decide whether it will be 11.6 or a different number. So if it's a a lower number at that time based on them projecting higher water use from higher volume availability, but we've already adjusted our rates. Is that, or it's just- No, gonna this is going to be a pass through. It's so pass -through. we will give customers got it, got it. 30 days notice and pass through whatever the rate increase is, unless, you know, yeah, that's what we're planning to do. Okay. Thank you. 
So then we would need to take action uh, uh, on this item before proceeding to the second. And so can we uh, see the staff recommendation again? And that correlates to a percentage increase, you had told us. Uh, that's 7%? A 7% overall and a 3% on the distribution rates. That's a big bump, and I'm just looking in, and, and the part of the issue for us tonight is that we're we're needing to look at these not only as the, the the factors driving that individual commodity and 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 utility uh, of water, but this whole package and its impact on our ratepayers, and um, and that's that's actually it. Uh, yeah, it's the second highest, no third highest bump, but it's a significant increase, and. I'm struggling whether there's any way to um, hold off on that level of increase pending the updates that we receive from SFPUC. So would there be a potential for us to say at this point in time, we're going to authorize X and at the, when we have the, um, uh, those numbers and come back with the, the, maybe in our budget cycle, look at whether we need to add Y or not add Y above what we would approve tonight. Is that a possibility? Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, I want to, I want to understand your question a little bit better. We, you know, we, the, the way we've designed this rate, the SFUC charge is a pass through um, straight away, like whether it goes up or down, it, it is going to be a pass through. And so the, the proposal in front of you to use reserves just applies to the distribution part of the rate. And just to clarify for me, so the seven percent does that include the anticipated pass through or not? Yes. Okay. And um, whether or not whether the SPUC rate ends up being higher or lower than we think it will be today, the proposal for how to use reserves doesn't yeah. change. Right. We, we would still be hitting that minimum in those years. And we would still be, if we, you know, if we used more reserves sooner rather than later, we'd still be looking at higher rate increases down and, the road. And so us, even if we doubt whether the pass-through will be as high as they're currently projecting, we don't have a good mechanism to hold back on their projection at this point in time. We've got to, we've got to build that projection, their current projection, into our proposed increases? We are building their projection into our into our projection of what the rate increase will look like, but our design of how to hold distribution rates down as low as possible doesn't change. Right, I got that, yeah. yeah. Can I ask the the 7% change that is at issue right now, if I'm looking at the chart correctly on page seven, it amounts to a $6.90 uh the increase on the monthly bill right so in terms of the impact on our public we're talking about under seven dollars a month 84 dollars a year increase if approved the seven percent right right i'm comfortable with that yeah well my concern isn't that in isolation it's the entire package of utility sure. increases and that's where it it becomes more problematic. If that was our only significant increase, I'm, I'm a lot more sanguine on that. But as you've explained it, um, I'm not seeing really an alternative other than to project uh, or put in our projected rate increases what is currently SFPUC's projected pass-through on the commodity. Okay. Guys, one yeah. And then just the future years on the water utility, I mean, it drops significantly. Is is the assumption there out of the drought and operating normally? I mean, I guess customer, you know, customer um, behavior being normal. 
for Palo Alto's distribute. So what that is that chart is showing is the combination in each year of the commodity rate increase and the Palo Alto distribution increase, and it's between three and five percent. The Palo Alto distribution increase in each year um, project uh, incorporates a slow, you know, return to a little bit lower than normal water usage. Um, uh, on, on the commodity side, SFPC is projecting, you know, the increase in the next upcoming year, and then a relatively flat uh, rate projection over the next several years with a little bit of inflationary increase. I'm not exactly sure what their demand forecast is included in each of those years. Okay. I think that'd be interesting to see you know, if, if the, is there an assumption that now that we are coming out of the drought, if not out of the drought already across the state, is the assumption that we're not going to return to it in a, in a couple of years and don't know how we can possibly make that prediction. Um, so I think that's, I'd be curious about that. Um, but I understand. Dean, do you want to add to that? No, I just wanted to add one quick. Okay, that, that's all I had. One just last thing I wanted to add. Uh, Chair Burke. So as you heard from Jonathan earlier today, you know, one of the things is you look at this overall package that we're talking about, there's a strong possibility, as we talked earlier about, with all the consumption of the snow and water at our hydro rates. And now we could also maybe drop that hydro rate or just or even lower than the 50% that we're dropping it into what you're seeing in tonight's rates. So as you see that overall package, we may see that the bottom line dollar amounts as a whole will go down even a little bit further than that. Yeah, I share that hope and to some degree anticipation. Yeah. Could I ask yeah. a, another um, clarifying question? Um, am I correct in, as I look at these numbers in seeing that the 7% rate is a combination, close to 50-50 combination, the projected increase in the commodity rate and the cost of distributing water. Is that correct? Exactly. So that if the pass-through from SFPUC turns out to be less than then we are going to see a significant decrease in the monthly rate. Moderate decrease. Okay. It depends on what the pass-through decrease is. Yeah, well. But it is 50% of the cost is what is that commodity price. Yeah, but the commodity is uh, actually has capital spending and another category and then the water use. So it's only really the water use that we expect could drop. I so see. It's the only... portion of the pass-through that is water use is a smaller percentage than I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, I guess at this time, um, I'll entertain a motion on the recommendation to the council. I'll move the staff recommendation. Second. All right, any further discussion? No. no. All right, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 And that passes unanimously. All right, now we will move on to our next item which is the water collection utility financial uh, or um, uh, staff recommendation on a water collection utility, I'll just say. And uh, Lisa, are you presenting? That? Go right ahead. Yes, okay. But for the wastewater utility, this is a 9% overall rate increase production, which is $4 per month for an average residential customer. There are two main drivers for the rate increase proposal. One is the treatment plant cost increases over the next several years. There are planned for debt service increases and loan repayment increases um, to really uh, pay for upgrades at the treatment plant. There's many components of the treatment plant that have been in service for over 40 years, and they provide service to the residents and businesses in Palo Alto 24 hour a day, every day of the year, and many of those components need to be replaced. And so there's upcoming costs associated with the treatment plant that are included and planned for in this forecast for the wastewater collection utility. The other component of the increase is to accelerate the rate of sewer main replacement from the 
one mile per year, which is the average rate over the past several years to a 2.5 mile per year rate starting in fiscal year 2026. And the goal of this is to replace the mains within their life expectancy or as close to the life expectancy as, as possible. Last year, we did bring this proposal to the UAC and to the Finance Committee, and the recommendation and alternatives included here are to try to be responsive to the recommendations from the Finance Committee and the UAC from last year. And so the recommendation is to achieve that 2.5 miles per year in 2026, and the three alternatives achieved that same rate of acceleration to 2.5 miles per year, but at a later date. So the alternative A uh, mitigates the rate increase needed with the only one year of 9% increase, uh, but doesn't get to the uh, 2.5 miles per year until 2028. Alternative B reduces the rate increase needed to 7% in the upcoming year, but doesn't get to the rate of main replacement and, uh, at 2.5 miles per year until 2034. And alternative C limits rate increase every year to 5%, but doesn't get to the 2.5 miles per year in 2034. So we're getting further and further from the 100-year life expectancy of the pipes. And the by doing that, we increase the likelihood of increasing the repair and maintenance costs and having other impacts on the uh, pipes, including overflows and sinkholes. So I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures of the types of pipes that are prioritized in the main replacement program. Um, these are pictures of mains that have structural defects. So they have broken pipes or missing sections. And I wanted to show you if it works, a brief picture video, seven seconds of one of these pipeline sections that has a missing section. So this is a structural defect that can't be addressed through routine maintenance type of activity that water to the treatment plant, the regional. Oh, sorry, when it's broken. Yeah. It oh, just goes into the ground and then, yeah. I want to thank Dean for crawling down there and taking this photo. <laughs> Best for you. <laughs> so this is a picture of the cost and revenue for the wastewater utility. We have the costs in the stacked bars and you see the light and dark blues are the treatment costs. The light blue is the treatment operations costs and the light dark blue is the treatment capital and debt. And you can see the increases over time over the next five years. And then the collection on the collection system, I wanted to point out the orange bars, which is the increase in the uh, capital and debt needed over the next several years. And you can see the revenue did decline a little bit during the COVID time period and is is recovering uh, and projected to increase over the uh, over the next five years. And I wanted to just mention, we talked a little bit about reserves for the operations reserve. It's projected to remain within the guideline ranges. And then for the CIP reserve, there's a separate reason why it drops down to zero. And that is because for the ongoing main replacement that's happening right now or projected to happen this year, um, it needs to move. It was budgeted in 2024, but because of a budget change, we need to move it to 2023 in order to coordinate with Caltrans on repaving on El Camino. And so that by moving it to 2023, there was less time to accumulate funding for that project, and that's why it temporarily goes to zero. Um, and what the chart shows is that we have a plan to bring that reserve back into the guideline range over the next five years. And with that, I wanted to tell you about our recommendation. Which is, again, we discussed this with the Utility Advisory Commission last week, who unanimous, unanimously approved staff recommendation for the financial plan, including the 9% overall increase, a transfer from the CIP reserve, the 3.2 million to operations reserve to fund the, the in replacement, the use of the remaining 342,000 from the rate stabilization reserve by transferring those funds to the operations reserve, um, and then the risk schedules. So with that, I'd be happy to try to answer any of your questions. Um, Julie? Thank you so much, um, Lisa. I am struck by this 100-year thing 
and how we've got mains that were installed in the 1950 to 1970 range. And here we are having to face a tough fiscal decision of whether we go with the recommendation or one of the alternatives facing a set of costs today that others might have prevented us from having to face had they done the necessary replacement in earlier years. And I'm struck by the fact that if we don't make the tough decision now, we're just kicking that can further down the street and potentially facing this sort of, you know, some element of, of these mains will not be replaced in the 100-year time frame. And then we face sinkholes and other potential problems that people will be up in arms that we allowed to happen. So I'm sort of curious as to how reliable are these 100-year things? What evidence do we have from surrounding communities that these mains really do rupture in 102 or 108 or not really to 132 years? Like how, what kind of evidence do we have, the degree of risk that we're taking if we don't fully replace the mains in their 100-year lifetime? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, my name is Matt Zuka. I am the assistant director for water, gas, and wastewater. So I'll, I'll try to answer that one. Um, it, the short answer is it's not a precise formula. Um, it's sort of based upon, I would say, industry experience. And uh, we have to make assumptions um, sort of about the overall life cycle. So some of them are going to probably fail at 50, 60, 70, 80 years, and some of them might last longer. So it's really kind of an average. And there's a lot of different factors that are going to go into that. Um, some of it could be soil conditions, groundwater levels, uh, the depth of the pipe, uh, all, you know, a bunch of different factors. Uh, so really what we're trying to do is lay out a plan here where, uh, and actually it, it, I've said this in some of the previous presentations, it's a, it's a really good place to be, to be trying to plan around the entire life cycle of an asset. Um, a lot of times what you'll see cities doing is they'll identify a bunch of deficiencies, figure out how much it's going to take to fix just those deficiencies, but they're not thinking about the whole the whole we're going to get to the end of the Golden Gate Bridge at some point, and we're going to start over again. And that's kind of what we're really trying to do here. Um, so you know, the bottom line is it's not a price estimate. Um, what we do know is that the last two years of that asset, though, so when you see some of the tables that say, hey, um, it's uh, 2020 or it's 2028, not 2028, what was the year? I can't remember the last one up the top of my head. Um, but some of those outer years where they're, in, yeah, the, the, those last two years of that asset are not the same. Thank you. The, the outer years of that asset aren't going to be the same as the first couple of years of that asset. And so um, not all years are created equal. And uh, when we start looking at going much beyond, even at 108 years, which is what the current rate structure proposes, we're still 8% beyond the best guess that we have of what the life cycle is going to be. So every extra year is another percent, if you will, on that. And it's the worst year that we're borrowing from of that asset. So it's not a precise science, the best we can do. Um, and it's sort of a good planning level number. Can I just clarify, what do you mean by it's the worst year we're borrowing from sure. in the life cycle of that asset? So if I, if I look at the asset, um, like, for example, the picture you saw, those are the ones that are at the end of their useful life that we want to get rid of. The longer we leave those in the ground, the worse, the more likelihood we're going to have of a failure, the more likelihood there is of a SSO. Um, and so it's, that's, those are the worst years that we want to extend. So that's, that's kind of the rub, right? Is that um, going from 108 year asset life to 115 or 14 or whatever, those last few years are the really problematic ones and we're extending it there. I can't borrow from the first 10. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, SS, sometimes these jargon terms, SSO, sanitary sewer overflow. Um, so we have, <laughs> thank you for asking me to define that. Yeah, uh, so let me back up. Um, when, when these pipes fail, we have the sewage flowing, um, the, that, that happens 24 seven, uh, as, as Karin, uh, can attest to the plant receives that all, all day long, every day. Uh, we also have issues that will exacerbate sewage flow, which we call I and I, another jargon nickname, uh, but it's inflow and infiltration. So when we get rain events on top of the normal sewage flow in the pipes, we'll also get an increase in flow just from infiltration, groundwater, um, rainfall going over manholes, that kind of thing. And when the, the condition of the sewer pipes deteriorates and no longer pass the flow along, um, can no longer move the solids and it, um, uh, it, it, it'll back up and then it overflows through a manhole and it goes into a creek. Those are things that we monitor. We have to report that there is uh, a fair amount of, uh, I would say, environmental liability that the city would carry if we start having a number of those reach the creek. Um, that is sort of protected under the Clean Water Act. So we, we certainly want to be managing our sewage infrastructure to um, mitigate that. Thanks. So that the, I mean, the incremental increase each year itself doesn't seem that bad, but I think kind of going back to 
uh, the chair's point in the, la- the last item, more concerned about the, the aggregate. And by fiscal year 28, seems like it's a pretty significant increase over that time I and mean, over $20 a month from now till then. And I think for many customers, it's going to be really surprising to go from, I think, 28% lower than a lot of our neighboring communities, actually 5% higher. Um, so, you know, kind of understanding, but interested to see if it, if it's similar to the last item where there's not much that we can, can really do with that. Uh, and also how likely just based on historic trends, is it that those rates may be lowered if circumstances change? Just on the, the reference that you're making to the 5% higher than the neighboring communities, that does assume that the neighboring communities don't increase their rate at all right. over the next five years. So that we thought that was kind of a conservative estimate um, because uh, other communities are likely facing maybe similar situations or treatment cost increases that they have to pay for. Um, I think I didn't answer your second part of the question. Well, and let's... Uh... Uh, burrow in on that a little bit, because I recall from last year, I think it was on the presentation when we were looking at, you know, we're, we're uh, in just entering a once in two generation investment in rebuilding our wastewater treatment plant. And uh, while we were looking at bids on that, we were seeing, and, and part of our concern was the bids were coming in above original estimates. But we looked at some of the uh, other agencies in the subregion that were going through similar uh, rebuilds, and they were experiencing bids coming in as much or higher above projections than we were. If I remember right, one of them was Hayward. And is that correct? And they're doing a major rebuild? Or am I mixing that up? It wasn't Hayward? Okay. Yeah. So we've got this collection system and then the treatment plant, which are the two big factors in this. And um, the other communities are liable to have similar needs on collection and they're going to similar rebuilds, not all at the same pace. Basically, our rebuild of our plant is overdue. And I had for a number of years had thought that we should be um, because we were so much below uh, neighboring communities. When you look at Los Altos and Mount View, they're they're the same wastewater treatment plant as us. And so we're all in the same ballpark. We compare it to our neighbors to the north of Mount Park, Redwood City, or we're sharing the same one. And it's double the wastewater treatment rates. And it means that we really were holding back on charging our customers for the necessary capital investments that were on the horizon. And now we're charging them real time as we're building that. I frankly think we should have built up that capital reserve even more and spread that increase over time because we were half the cost of our neighbors. Um, But we are where we are on that. I will say that the, uh, I, I fully agree with staff that the uh, the other neighboring communities are going to have similar, not identical, increases on both their collection system and then their treatment uh, plant capital costs. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, because we're, I mean, we're seeing this with issues of, I mean, always making the argument of of Palo Alto utilities compared to PG&E and trying to make those comparisons. I think at the end of the day, most Palo Altans are not focused on what others are are charging. So, still, I think this is going to become as a bit of a shock, and I, I agree with you. I wish we had built this up over a longer period of time, um, rather than this. This I mean, it's a dramatic increase, but a significant one over the next over the next few years. So, is the goal for wastewater revenues to really just kind of have normal profit um, and and do these rate increases allow us to be able to achieve that goal? And again, we're just trying to cover the costs. This is covering the costs of the treatment costs and. the Distribution. I mean, the collection system loss. Yep, and that's council prior uh, policy, and, uh, and to make sure the reserves remain within the guideline yep. range. Okay, perfect. So the same as as our water utility. Yes. Perfect. Thank and you. and profit isn't quite the right word in this context, right? 
because we're not allowed to make money on uh, above our reasonable expenses and projected capital needs. Is if I'm understanding that correctly. So that's why I meant normal profit right. just cover those costs. Okay. Thank you. So one thing I want to touch on is the projection on slide number six. Um, the projection that we have on revenue as a result of um, that we charge on per gallon uh, that and so everybody my colleagues and everybody understands this is this is water that goes down our sanitary sewers so it's our toilets our showers our dishwashers our washing machines that's pretty much it it's not our our water use per se in our outdoor gardening and all that, which is our highest water use, certainly in the summer months. Uh, in the winter months, it's primarily the interior water use. But in a drought, we shower shorter, we flush less, we conserve water indoors. And so as we emerge from the drought, the projection on how much revenue we will get from water use and water that we have to treat actually goes up. And we don't seem to be, or maybe we're projecting that a little bit. We've got on, yeah, we've got a modest increase. So are, we're assuming a return to normal water use in the wastewater collection volume. Yeah, I think you're talking about the non-residential revenue for sewer. Um, the, the residential charge is a monthly service charge. It's a fixed amount. Yeah, volume about... Forty-five dollars currently, and but for the non-residential, exactly um, the the, re the restaurants are charged based on the previous month of usage, water usage as a proxy, and the uh, com uh, commercial are charged based on the winter usage, water usage. And we're so we're that's right because we don't meter it; we're a, a flat rate for residential. Yes, and so what happened was during the years impacted by the COVID policies, uh, pandemic policies, that non-residential revenue did decline, I think about 11%. And uh, it's it has started coming back, particularly on the restaurant side and is, and is also coming back on the commercial side, but is not quite yet back to pre-pandemic levels. And we are including that in the projections. Got it. Okay. And then when we're looking at uh, deterioration of our collection system, these pipes, um, we had great video and and, uh, and photos in recent years, or perhaps it's decades. We've we've had better ability to monitor actual conditions. We can you refresh me on how we, to what extent we actually look at main sewer lines and their condition, and we we that we have information that and when did we start getting better information from that monitoring of video cameras than we used to yeah we we have a, an entire crew dedicated to just being able to cctv cameras and flush and do maintenance um so that's part of our regular uh, protocol and in fact um as part of our design when we're trying to pick and select pipes for the next round we'll rely on that information to help prioritize uh, and on one of our upcoming, um, the one, in fact, that was discussed earlier that we're sort of accelerating to get ahead of Caltrans, um, as we were going through some of the prioritization, we actually had our operations crews go out there and collect more data to sort of further inform the prioritization. Uh, prices were coming in high. We were trying to figure out were there certain segments that we could maybe wait five years or, or do that kind of thing. So a lot of the the um immediate prioritization is based around that really hard data uh, we're looking at it we're collecting these videos and um, sort of analyzing them the long term we don't really know how it's going to degrade over time so we're doing the planning level estimate that, that was kind of what i was trying to get a feel for is to what extent are we able to use this monitoring data to really know our next several years uh a, a plan versus the longer term we have to have just a generalized projection yeah, that's exactly the approach. Um, we we sort of will do more discrete prioritization. Uh, if we sort of also identify any actual failures that might move certain pipe segments um, differently along the list, or if our crews are out there 
and something that was in a future uh, planned future year, we all of a sudden through video footage identify that there is a, a more significant issue, then we might accelerate that. So we're constantly balancing that. I won't say we get every foot of main every year by any stretch of the imagination, but we do try to um, uh, make that as uh, available as possible to prioritize. So putting aside for the moment, the long-term pace of going from one mile a year to two and a half miles a year, based on this monitoring data that we actually do have, how miles a year do you think we need to do over the next one, three, and five years? Do you have a sense of that? Um, no. Uh, well, I have a sense, but I don't know if I can give you a hard number. Okay, um, I think that sense. The, the, the sense of it is that um, uh, it's going to take us a little bit of time to ramp up and be able to produce that kind of a design, um, a little bit of time. So it's a couple of years, backing up a second. We will design one year, build the other on each, each of the utilities. So it's going to take us a couple of years to then really make sure that we do a thorough job of identifying and picking the next grouping of high priority pipes. Um, and then what's left over gets sort of kicked to the next grouping. And then we'll reevaluate at a point in time. Um, so we would probably, as we finish up in the next year, what we call SSR for sanitary sewer replacement 31, the 30 for project. Um, as we finish up SSR 31, we would then move into design, obviously SSR 31, which was just bid, we know which pipes are in there. Um, once that's getting near the end of construction, we'd be looking at then identifying, you know, based on the data that we have, best available data that we have, what the next high priority grouping of pipes would be. If so that answers your question. It helps. Um, so then when we look at, on slide two, the, um, the alternatives that we're considering we're front loaded on years 24 and 25 and uh, actually based on the recommendation it's even through 26 and 27 before it starts dropping to 5% increase and the other alternatives um, are less either less front loaded or a shorter period of time that's front loaded so we've got pretty good visibility here in design phase right now for the things you're going to do in 24 and 25. Um, if we were to select alternative B, would you be able to uh, implement what you can now see you need to do in actual 24, 25, maybe even 26 pipes? And then... Uh, we make that next adjustment uh, and review that a year or two years from now and look at what rate increase we need at that time, knowing that eventually we've got to get up to this two and a half miles a year. But jumping from one mile a year to two and a half miles a year, it results in a significant rate increase at this point in time. We have a lot of increases going on and a big community sensitivity to overall utility rates because of these electric and gas bikes primarily. And if I understood correctly, I might try to answer your question slightly differently, which is to say that I we would, I believe, be able to determine what the next grouping of pipes would be. However, the last column in that table, 20, um, alternative B, the next project, we wouldn't be at the 2.5 miles until 2034. So then at that rate, the last asset is going to be that much older on back side. It's no longer going to be 108 years old. It's going to be yeah. Um, I'm bad at mental math, but it'll be 108 plus. But if what if B was something a little different? If it was 7%, 7%, 6, 6, and 6, then that brings us in to somewhere between the 2028 and 2034 to get to the two and a half miles a year, right? Um, Yes, I, I, I see the math. At, at the end of the day, it's it, it gets a little bit fluid in the sense of I, how much money are we collecting each year into the reserves and into the budget yeah, to be able precise. to. But, but it, effectively, it's, it's a matter of we can either uh, the, the front loaded on the rate certainly starts the, the revenue collection process and allows us to accelerate the start date. And that's why the three nines allow us the most sort of, I would say, aggressive start date. And at, even at the start of 2026, we're still at 108 years for the last pipe. That's the the last pipe being replaced out of this this go round. Um, uh, but but seven and seven, if alternative B, would allow us to keep pace on what we're already designing as needing to be done in 2024, 25, perhaps 26. That's that's kind of the foresight that you have 
based upon specific pipe analysis that you've done. And then beyond that, you start moving into a longer term projection, which is we don't know exactly what we need to do in years 27 and 28, but we're, we're trying to move into that longer term need at that point in time. And so what I'm really inclined toward right now is a version of B, which would be 7% and 7% the next two years and anticipate 6% increases thereafter with an understanding that as this committee and council look at this next year and the following year, we could decide to up that rate uh, of replacement even further and basically get into that two and a half mile a year uh, pace sooner than the modified B would do. And I'm not hearing that um, if we went to B that we would have any negative impact on the next couple of years replacement rates, um, but that we would need to ultimately bite that bullet um, uh, in the coming years, uh, either upping it to 6% in 2026 and thereafter, or through some other approach. Um, but we also should recognize that, so say we did that, we did a modified B, 7%, 7%, and then 6% thereafter. It looks to me like that's about 2031, we'd get to the um, two and a half mile a year uh, replacement rate. And that would mean that we we are nevertheless going from one mile a year to two and a half miles a year. That's a big increase to what we should have been doing all along. It's a big step. And I think about times where we as a council looked at how did we uh, 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 adjust our underfunded pension liabilities? And we didn't bite that all off at once. We did it in chunks. And too abrupt of a change uh, was too hard of a hit on the budget. But we got there. And we're ahead of almost every other community in terms of what we're investing in the uh, uh, unfunded pension liabilities. Um, and I'm thinking along the same lines here. Uh, in this in this year, to take the alternative B, but to modify it with uh, years 26 onward, anticipating the 6%, just not this year and next year going to the 9%. Right. And if I might, I, and certainly it's council, the council's prerogative to set rates as the policymaker. So there's nothing in what I'm saying that, that is intended to um, go against that. Uh, I would just point out that at that point, the um, uh, if we're going to hold to the same target useful life, we're not going to be doing two and a half miles a year anymore. We're going to be talking a higher rate increase. So then we're, if we're going to extend it now uh, beyond, much farther beyond the end of its useful life, instead of 8%, we're now at you know, 13, 15, 20% beyond and borrowing into the bad years, if you will. So that's the risk is going down, down into the future. Um, albeit when none of us are going to be working and, and probably live, but well, that doesn't and, matter. And um, if we compare <laughs> what even that would be to what we've done for the last 50 years, it is a big in, right. improvement. And, and then just to finish up, the second thing I was going to say is that that 9%, I know it's uh, something uh, from a percentage standpoint, um, but it's less it, than a dollar a month. It's four dollars a month, is I think, uh, if, I if I'm on the right slide, slight nine, it's, it's, it is only four dollars a month. And I'm not trying to, only is probably not the right term, it is four dollars a month. Um, but those are the two things that I just wanted to point out. Is well, that if we you are... had to take it out of Lisa's increase, <laughs> uh, I'm okay. <laughs> But yeah. the problem is they they are cumulative, and this is what the concern is. Right, understood. Is, yeah. But the four dollars a month—that's the increase if, to do any of this is a four dollar. The recommended is a four dollar month. Correct. The difference between recommended and alternative B is eighty cents a month or ninety cents a month. I mean, so we're talking about saving ninety cents a month by going from the recommended to al alternative B. Which I I agree with you, Pat, on the don't bite it all off right now. But I'm kind of in this. My my mindset on this is, it seems like prior folks have already kicked this can to us, and I'm more inclined to say, you know what, this is our reality. The monthly increase is relatively minor in terms of the differences between alternative B and the recommendation, and I'm really worried about what's going to happen if we end up in this 108, 114, and beyond year maintenance plan for the final bits of the main. So that's why I'm inclined to go with a recommendation. 
I do have a question for you, Dean. Um, and forgive me, this is probably not the kind of conversation we normally have with the finance committee, but this is the way I think. And so I'd like to try to understand it visually. And the narrative talked about how Caltrans is supposedly going to do Amino next year, which is awesome. I all of a sudden pictured like, okay, they open up the road, whether it's El Camino or University Avenue or what have you, we've got all these lines. We've got water, we've got wastewater, we've got gas, we've got electric if it's underground, we've, maybe we get some fiber in there. What is among senior leadership? Is there a big map somewhere like, oh, hey, we're planning on doing this to this main for the waste treatment. Oh, hey, we over here on the water side are planning to do that 10 years later. Oh, hey, we here are Thanks contemplating so fiber are planning. Like, is there a big map somewhere where senior leadership talks about this and make sure that we are achieving efficiencies, certainly not having redundancies, or God forbid, you just dug that up, we just repaved that. Yeah, th there is. Um, you know, down in the engineering group, um, there's actually three separate maps um, of the city. And uh, we look, we do look at uh, where we can get some synergies around some of the projects that might be coming up. And, you know, maybe the gas main is not going to be replaced for another four years. Well, we're not going to be able to tear up El Camino in four years as we just replaced this sewer main. Um, so, and then we also work with public works as well when they're going to repave a street. Same idea is that, uh, you know, we don't want to go back in there within the monitorium of five year period of time to rip up another street because now the residents are going to be, you know, not not too kindly to the utility side. Um, the, the worst thing about it is, is that um, the water, gas and wastewater is not used as a joint trench. So they're at different levels and there are different spaces. So you might have wastewater that's going to be a little bit um, deeper because it's gravity flow or the water and gas are pressurized. So they're not going to be as deep into the ground levels, but we do keep them separated because of that. Um, now, on the electric side, we can put fiber, we can put electric in the same trench lines. Um, we actually even put telephone in there when um, AT&T wants to come with us or Comcast wants to come with us. And they're on the opposite side of the streets. So we try not to put the street in jeopardy with all the utilities and jam pack them all on one side. And like I said, they are, and there, there's maps and engineering does look at What's the long feasibility? I mean, um, a couple, of, uh, maybe about this agent four years ago, three years ago, we tore up university. And so we had a water main that was um, in there and we wanted to put some fiber in there. And so we replaced the water main at the same time. Water main, I think it was water main. Anyway, we replaced the utility at the same time that we added um, 2,700 feet of uh, fiber conduit in there. And it was about time. It was about three or four years, and we were going to have to go in there anyway. So we do look at that opportunity every time we can build. And I'll just add two things that I think we do a better job of that than we used to. And this example that Dean just cited of university, we actually held off on that water main initially that was driving it because we wanted to relook at doing this as a set. And we said, wait a minute. Uh, don't proceed on this major need, even though it was scheduled. And so there is, um, uh, I think, a better integrated planning of that along with the timing of simply street repair than we formerly did. Are we ever in a circumstance where we're like, holy moly, we're here now with the asphalt taken up, we're in the trench, and we can see that there's a synergy we did not appreciate do we ever need to make a decision on the flyer, relatively speaking, quickly that cannot wait for it to go through the Utilities Commission and then Council? Do we ever find ourselves having to make emergency decisions um, that sort of circumvent traditional uh, timeline for policymakers? So I think the only time that that ever happens is if there's an emergency situation where we've torn up the street and we see some degradation of whatever that service may be or, or that main you know, our in-house crews will have to do that small fix because when the contractor, of course, you bid out this job, it's going to be a sewer. It's really hard for them to jump over and start doing a water. They may not even be qualified to do the water portion of it. So then we have to go back through the whole process if we have to replace, you know, large sections of a main or a large project where you get into the mile portion. But, you know, maybe it's a quarter mile um, because you see and you open it up. Um, yes, then our in-house crews, um, match crews, then would be able to go in there and make those repairs and extend that main um, piece that's bad. And I wanted to speak to, uh, Julie, kind of your point on, well, one from a uh, a long-term management of 
the investments in capital needs of these various utilities and other costs that may not be capital, uh, we can look at these individual rate increases and we say, well, they're not so bad. Um, But what we really are also facing is right now uh, we have uh, an acute uh, uh, focus in our community by residents and businesses on these spikes in rates. And those spikes, when we look at the importance of our climate plan, the willingness of the community to embrace the financial investments needed to address our climate plan are tied to how they perceive these other rate increases. And we can say, gee, that's a small amount, or um, gee, it's really really important to do this long-term and uh, and we undermine the community's support for something that is extremely important. And that's what I'm trying to balance. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm willing to uh, look at how do we mitigate without jeopardizing uh, some of these increases, even if we can't radically change them. And um, and I think that's extremely important. And it's, it's um, uh, not addressed specifically here because it's not what's right in front of us, but our community looks at these things in that broader context at some intuitive level, maybe more than specific analytical level on a given increase. And I'm very concerned about that. I'm inclined to defer to you on that because of who you are, how long you've been at this. I seriously am. Okay. I I appreciate that. Um, You're saying that it makes me want to go back to the one we just approved because, you know, this particular increase seems to be so small that I can't see consumers saying that. Um, but I um, I absolutely um, get that your read on this is probably far more accurate than I'm even capable of, given how many years you've been at this. Well, thanks, Anne. What's on our horizon, the importance of having the community support for what we believe in. Um, and and Maybe the, the the prior one would have been more dollars, but we have to look at each one in terms of, is there really something that we could do that would not be any significantly detrimental and still gives us the ability to make the long-term investments at the right point in time, um, but to mitigate these these uh, this year's significant increases on top of these unanticipated spikes that we're all contending with. Can somebody remind me what percentage of the overall utility bill goes to water versus wastewater? Yeah, let's go back to that slide. I can oh, I have it in this deck. Um... It's a really good question. I don't think I have that off the top of my head, but we have it in that green table. I just need to pull that up. And I'll just say that we've got it, including in two weeks, these even bigger categories okay. of gas and electric. Um, and so uh, water is high, wastewater is not a lot, uh, but so, water, water, gas, and electric. So that's why I don't want us to ding wastewater when it really isn't the problem. I'm kind of inclined to say the bigger things that are coming in two weeks are actually speaking to what people are currently really up in arms out to start with, then maybe we want to be much more fiscally conservative and have a longer term plan in two weeks on gas and electric, but let this water proceed. My with inclination the is to look at where we can mitigate a big increase um, in a reasonable way. And, uh, and I don't disagree that those are the bigger uh, numbers. Water is a big number too, uh, but I'm just inclined to to mitigate where we we can, and uh, and and go about it that way. And uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of my guiding principle on this. So, Chair Bird, if I could just add uh, one thing, <clears throat> as you heard from Lisa, with especially with this going around this um, Project Thirty One that's on on El Camino. You know, the bids came in around $2 million larger than what we had budgeted for. We're asking, you know, to borrow those dollars in the future years. Um, 
with their plan of asking for the 7% um, in that next year, there's a strong possibility that there will not be a CIP in that because 7% brings only in about $500,000 because as we know, wastewater is a very low amount um, in the capital aspects of it. And so the concern may be is that um, as we continue and if we have to do more on the maintenance side, you know, it may not, it won't be capitalized, of course, but the maintenance costs will go up um, as we go because we are going not going to be able to get to the, even the one mile portion of it in the coming next year because we're borrowing those dollars now. We need to, and we do need to get those dollars out in for the future for right now. So when we were presented these different alternatives, are are you saying that? I mean, one of the alternatives is alternative C and. It sounds like what you're saying, if we even considered alternative C, that would have a very significant impact on necessary capital uh, replacements. I just want to add that the costs for the pending, uh, as Matt mentioned, there's a pending sewer replacement. So even after we finalize this report, there's been changes in the budget going up as that has just gone out to bid. Um, so we did our best to present proposals. I think that there may be impacts on that near-term project, the SSR 31, from lowering the increase beyond what we expected in the uh, alternatives that we presented. Uh, but we would be happy to develop that alternative that you described earlier. Okay. So... I don't want to do something that is going to have a detrimental impact on project that we need to do in the near to medium term. Um, and uh, maybe on this one, I would suggest that we pull over this item to our meeting on the 21st so that you can provide that supplemental info and we can make a more informed decision if that's okay. Okay, Greer. Yeah, you know, I I'm I'm fine. I'm fine with that. I'd also like, you know, in the on the 21st and just in the future, if if staff has a recommendation, and especially if the US UAC is supporting it as as well to have um you know a real defense of that recommendation. I mean, I think our, our conversations are important and, and helpful. And I'm kind of been on the on the fence. And I think this has been a good a good discussion. I just haven't been hearing much from staff as far as why this recommendation is is the best is the best option and why these alternatives are not the preferred ones so fine with delaying this conversation to the 21st to be able to get uh the chair's um, alternative out there as well if, if i can just offer just you know kind of take this back to the framing of this um staff's put forward a recommendation it's as matt said not based on hard 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 science and that um, it is certainly council's uh, prerogative to do something less aggressive, and that's a matter of weighing council's acceptance of risk. And so staff's recommendation is based on what we think the best available industry science out there is and, and um, you know, a fairly risk averse stance from staff standpoint that sewer overflows and pipes breaking are a bad thing and um we don't want the city to get into that situation but that's not to say that at year 105 that you know we're going to have a bunch of problems on the next day so staff's recommendation is based on that and if council wants to accept more risk around the system then there are alternatives that um can accommodate that one of the more discussion I, dean i think what you were going there was was helpful kind of sizing if we delay this more at least this is how i was interpreting it we delay this more we we risk more kind of minor breaks that might require some minor repairs which requires more more funding which delays us then further on actual replacement and do we see ourselves in a far worse position if we wait several years rather than kind of just signing it up now and and paying costs and doing the infrastructure improvement so I think all of that would be really helpful because I have no clue about wastewater and pipe replacements and all of that. So I'm deferring to the experts here. So that I thought what you were what you were saying was helpful. Well, and so I I'm going to move that we continue this item to 22nd. Um, but you know, it's 
we've we're looking at uh, a significant and necessary increase in our investment in this replacement schedule. It's a question of how much we suck it up in the year with a bump and where we have our ratepayers who are up in arms about increases that we couldn't control. And um, and how do we balance those issues? And that's that's what I'm struggling with. All right, so I'll move that we continue um, uh, to the 21st, if there's a second. I'll second. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. Okay, good. Uh, and I'll just say, these have been really healthy discussions and informative for us. So, okay, now we move on to the storm and surf water, uh, surface water drainage item number three. I'm, I'm sorry, Council Member Burke. Do I have if it wrong? we just have no, if we can just have a really uh, clear direction on what you want to see us come back with on the 21st. Yeah, it would be what would be the implications um, on uh, replacements on the horizon, whatever our current visibility is, two years or so, of adopting. Uh, alternative A or a modified version of alternative B, as I suggested, that might go to um, the seven and seven percent, but then in twenty six through twenty eight up it to six percent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll take a just a moment. Pause. Let people.
Our next is storm and surf water. Uh, surf water. Why do you keep saying surf water? It makes me think yeah, of yeah. <laughs> California surf days. Drainage. Karin, welcome. My name is Karin North. I'm the assistant director of public works. Um, and this is a fairly simple item. It's our stormwater management fee increase that was Basically, we're just following up with the voters what they approved in 2017. It's a CPI increase, so we can go to the next one. Oh, thanks, Vinny. You already did that. Um, so our fee is there's back in 2017 when the voters approved, about 55% goes to ongoing stormwater management programs. That one does not sunset. So that's litter, water pollution, prevention controls, our engineering staff, and storm drain maintenance and emergency response, which they've been very busy this season, as you can imagine. Um, and we're prepping for the next storm on Thursday. <laughs> and then the other 45% is to that does sunset June 1st of 2032, and that's for projects and infrastructure component. And so those we have the voters approved 13 um, approved projects. So we're we're slowly going through those storm system replacement and rehabilitation and then green storm and infrastructure innovative programs and a debt service for um, past capital projects and that should that those payment ends in fiscal year 24. We also have a stormwater oversight committee and I'm the staff liaison for that as well. So this is a little hard to see, but it just kind of gives you an idea of the 13 projects that were in the voter. I know, sorry, I apologize. The Just so you know, the items in red is done and the items in green are currently in design. And then the black ones are areas that are prioritized for future. And this is also on the our city website on the storm where you update it fairly regularly based on the project for the storm drain team. And then the next slide is the what we are hoping for the 24 proposed rate increase. It's a 4.9% increase. It's alignment with the CPI. Um, and so it's a 0.78. So we're going from 15.98 for equivalent residential unit to 16.76. And we're going to increase our budget by around 400,000. So I'm here to answer any questions. First, I realized I was remiss on the previous two items because I didn't confirm that we had no public speakers, and I, I'm confident he would have flagged me if we had, but uh, I should have uh, checked on that. Yeah, just for the record, we had no uh, members of the public online or in person. Thank you. Okay, we're good. Saved by the bell. Uh, and we're now in the last two items that are going to be uh, the easy part. How do you get the good straw? I don't know. I will take, I was here for wastewater too, because yeah, I oversee right. the treatment plant, but uh, yes, it's, this is an easy one. Okay. Can I just ask why we are even discussing it since it seems that we had a ballot initiative and it said it's the difference in CPI or 6%, the lesser of the two, why are we here? I totally agree. Um, I've been doing this for three or four years and every year I say the same thing, but I think it's just so for the public to understand what they've done and um, so they understand the rates and what it did in 2017. It's just for transparency. But yes, I, I'm right there with you. Well, it's also, to answer, no problem, to answer your question, <laughs> council member. Um, the other piece of it is, is when voters approve um, uh, rates, whether it be a rate like this or a tax, what they're approving um, typically in more modern um, ballot language or ordinances um, are maximums. So rates can go up to a maximum of, but in most modern ordinances, um, agencies include a clause that reserves the right for council on any year to do something lower than what voters have approved. And so on something like this, where the rate is variable based on the CPI, it is brought to council every year for your consideration and approval of what that adjustment would be, because do, technically you have the ability to choose something lower. Same thing actually goes for what you, the council and the voters just approved for the um, natural gas utility transfer, which we'll talk more about actually on the 21st of March, where I um, you know, watched the UAC last week, you'll see that there's a recommendation to transfer less than what the voters had approved. Um, and same thing for actually the new business tax um, that was just approved. Again, uh, the rates are approved by the voters, but council does have the authority to choose something lower. Mm -hmm. And um, there's another part to this, which is the actual projects, uh, as opposed to just the dollar amounts. And I wanted to ask on that, um, just for others' uh, information, in the previous ballot measure that we had had prior to this one, at the end of that measure, we had uh, 
a remaining district of South Heat, and we didn't have enough dollars to do a full traditional stormwater system. And we instead uh, experimented with a green stormwater uh, drainage system, which many of us have seen, and it was a hit. Uh, it worked well, and the community, that neighborhood valued it. Uh, uh, and it was uh, ecologically better because it meant that we were essentially percolating that water rather than having it compete for capacity in the creek during a flood period. Um, and, uh, and it refilled the water table at the same time. And as a result, my recollection is that in this uh, ballot measure, we said that that would, I don't know if we called it our default, but it became a preferred design alternative where it would work. So Karin, can yeah. you give us more context sure. on that aspect and how it fits with this um, set of projects? Sure. So um, the green storm infrastructure is actually more for the, the small kind of urban drool, smaller storm. It doesn't actually handle anything larger. Our current uh, storm drain system is actually designed for the 10-year storm. So even when we had that massive, massive event, our storm drain system actually performed pretty well because it was it is really only designed for the storm, 10 year storm. But we are trying to figure out other ways of incorporating green, green storm infrastructure, which slows the flow of water and also helps treat it. So then it's a higher quality water going into the storm drain system since that is not treated water. Um, and Southgate is a great example of it. If you haven't been by there, we've actually been refurbishing and rehabilitating those because we realized that they were kind of orphans and not taken care of. And so we're, we're finding uh, neighbors to uh, basically take care of them and nurture them and bring them back to, to good health, which is nice. And then also within our municipal regional stormwater permit, which is a requirement from the state, we have to actually treat a certain amount of water through green storm and infrastructure. So we're our the next five year permit cycle, we need to find basically treat for the equivalent of four acres of watershed um, needs to go through green storm and infrastructure. So that's part of where this funding goes is to identify and then build and then rehabilitate and maintain the, the green storm and infrastructure. Did you just use term of art urban rule? We we have lots of different terms of art, yes, but urban drool is something that now people are looking at as a value because it is the constant landscape water irrigation, the constant just water that fall, goes off of people's properties, and then we need to figure out how to treat it. And then usually those are the ones pick up all the contaminants. And who the won the prize for that term of art? You know, I think that was uh, some other stormwater manager that figures out how do we take that as and utilize it as a resource, right? But, yeah, it should have been run through the marketing department. Yes, um, <laughs> I apologize for my slang on urban drool. Um, and I'll just add one other note. As Karn was talking about the, the need to treat stormwater, um, there's both the mandate and then there's what are the technologies and how effectively can we do that? And what are the sorts of things that are running off from our streets that are actually pollutants, whether they're heavy metals, primarily copper, uh, or organic pollutants, including from our tires that just disappear on us. Um, and uh, studies uh, in the last couple of years have, up in Washington have shown that that, that tire particulate mm -hmm. is one of the principal drivers for salmon die-offs. Mm -hmm. And uh, more uh, 20 plus years ago, now more than that, more than 25 years ago, um, our uh, util uh, our wastewater utility uh, in collaboration with Stanford had a uh, a uh, just a breakthrough uh, uh, analysis that did, did discovered where the mis the unaccounted for copper that was going into the bay was coming from, and it was the brake pads in automobiles that are copper laden to basically reduce the squeaking. And that had national, if not international implications on redesigning copper brake pads to minimize that content because basically there was more copper in many circumstances than was needed. And that all ties into kind of these comprehensive approaches. I wanted to mention that because on the horizon, there may be another technology advancement that, um, we may be in the middle of a synergy on. So we're, we're the numbers are having preliminary discussions about um, with our 
carbon neutral goal. That means that we need to look at not only carbon reductions, but any ways that we can capture carbon. Uh, and uh, the Peninsula Clean Water, is that what they call it? In San Mateo County's wastewater treatment system directly to the north has been piloting a process that's called pyrolysis for their wastewater uh, treatment sludge, the solids that we get after we remove those contaminants from oh, um, the wastewater. So that's not this, that's when we, that pre prior discussion, what goes down actually the sanitary pipes as opposed to the stormwater pipes. That technology, uh, pyrolysis means it you cook this materials at high temperature in the absence of oxygen. It's not burning it. There's no CO2 released. And it basically turns that material into a form of charcoal. And that charcoal is called biochar. And one of the uses of biochar, it's similar to what we have in industry of activated carbon, which we actually even use in our wastewater treatment plant for more airborne contaminants. Um, is that right? No, it's For, used in our dual media filters. Okay. Um, and um, Caltrans did a study um, in the last two years on utilizing this biochar for highway um, runoff filtration and uh, very promising results, which is not surprising to me because I use these materials in industry for 30 years and there are different variations of activating char carbon or not. But it's a great material for that purpose. It's also an agricultural amenity. But we may in the future have a technology where we, instead of sending our sludge off site um, for uh, to be dried, we may uh, treat it in Palo Alto and create a very valuable product that we may use here or at the wastewater treatment plant. Those things are yet to be fully determined, but there's great deal of uh, advancements in in this um, uh, treatment of bio sludge. Frankly, um, in this field of pyrolysis and biochar, this had been one of the holy grails of, gee, could we ever treat bio sludge this way? The problem is it had too high a water content, but the process itself has a lot of waste heat and the next generation of technologies have captured the heat to move it back in a dry pre-drying the sludge so that you can cook it and make biochar. So that's a long introduction, but I wanted to start wetting our whistles on this. Um, and um, it goes into us having kind of a synergy of uh, approaches between the green stormwater approach, what we're next generation of wastewater treatment technologies, and kind of having a closed system on that. Uh, and I should add that when you turn in that charcoal, uh, that process produces biogas that we can use uh, to produce electricity. And if we go into fuel cells, non-carbon emitting electricity. Um, and uh, But the char uh, captures that carbon uh, for uh, hundreds of years, potentially. And so it's viewed as a carbon negative process that then we use that material for advantageous purposes like this. So this kind of uh, drifts into our uh, broader SCAP discussions, but it, how these efforts on the horizon may integrate with that. And that's, I'm not going to say cool. more. I Lovely. just had Thanks to share that. that one. I feel like I just went to uh, grad school for about yeah. a minute. All right. Uh, on that note, uh, I will move the staff recommendation on rate increases. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And now we move on to maybe an even easier one. Thank you. Thank you. So I did not... Uh... Put together a presentation on this. Um, it yeah, is <laughs> <laughs> so. I think a lot of you already know about this, but uh, the electric line construction division is currently um, with insignificant resources um, to meet the daily demands that uh, 
that we have. Um, we brought this uh, contract to you to the finance group just because of the large dollar amount. It's a $20 million contract over a five-year period of time. It is a larger contract than what we had with Hotline. Um, we did put out, uh, we advertised um, about 1,400 um, um, mailers went out to different contracts about this work. We only got three bidders to come back. Um, it was between 4.2 and 4.6 million dollars. Hotline was just over that 4.2 million dollar mark. We would have liked it per year. We would have loved to keep them, but uh, this is a brand new company to us, uh, VIP, and uh, they will be basically doing the same work that uh, we have. You know, as <clears throat> I don't think I really need to talk about this, but you know, we have insignificant uh, linemen positions right now. We have fine line. Five line people out of 20 authorized positions, three of them, five of them are fully um, a line person, and we have three apprentices going into their second year or their fourth year program. So we are pretty uh, significantly challenged on a daily basis, so we really truly need this contractor to really help us and basically do our maintenance work as well as um, getting ready for some electrification work that we're going to be doing. Um, and then also the one big thing on this is, is that's in this contract is emergency services. So as you, as you know, when we had these outages this past with the heavy winds that we had, you know, we started seeing outages around Monday, about two o'clock in the afternoon. We were able to get our last customers back up at three o'clock on Tuesday morning and our contractor worked side by side with our crews that we had. So we rely on them very much. So this contract is very important to us. Um, it is a larger contract than what we had with um, Hotline. It was a three-year contract with a total amount of $4.5 million, but we did come back to council and ask for an amendment on this for an additional $6.8 million um, of all the work that actually needed to be done. So we think that this is a much better deal, and we think that going to a five-year deal um, gets us some, um, some cost reductions um, that typically that we would not see if we were getting into a shorter contract. So um, we're asking um, finance group to basically adopt the termination of this um, action to expect the environmental rules under class one, which is existing facilities or CEQA, and then approve the authorization for the city manager to execute the contract um, for the 20 million um, over a five-year period of time, not to exceed $4 million at any given year. Um, during that period of time. So that was a recommendation um, to the finance group. Again, the reason why we wanted to bring it was just the large amount of monies um, and not just putting it on consent for everybody to wonder why we need $20 million from a utility standpoint. So with that, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, thanks. Um, so first, it is a big contract. How familiar are you with... Um, <laughs> VIP power line and you know we're moving it's a big contract with a new uh provider um we are not very familiar with VIP we have done some research on them um they seem to be a smaller uh, company than hotline is um they are and um have uh folks that are qualified um if you notice into the contract portions of it we put some heavy con um, language in there about termination for not fulfilling needs um, if, you know, we also put in there that they need to respond in an emergency standpoint within two hours. And if they can't fill those needs, then, you know, we're going to have to look at the contract and let these folks go. But right now, I, I wish I could tell you that I know them and, and they're doing great work. Um, but from everybody that we did, we, we checked on six sources um, and then and six references, six references. They gave us three. But what we found out that we knew a couple other folks that have actually used them and are using them. They're mostly a mid to a back east company. There's not too much on the west coast. They're kind of expanding out to this way. So, um, you know, we'll see what we what we get. Well, and those the most valuable references are typically the ones they don't give you. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, so the um, a couple things here. Uh, one is that. Appreciate this coming to the committee and uh, just to make sure everybody knows that typically a unanimous referral from a standing committee goes on consent, except we have in our procedures that it, it could go on to an action item just by virtue of the size rather than whether it's contentious or not. And um, because of that size, this is a $20 million contract, 
I would recommend we go ahead and put it on action, even if we anticipate a uh, very limited discussion at the council. Uh, uh, approving a $20 million contract without the council having that opportunity, uh, uh, I think uh, it, it Im falsely implies uh, a lack of scrutiny of the council over major expenditures. And so I would recommend yeah. that we do that. So, Chair, I will. I understand your perspective, and you are absolutely correct that we at times choose to put items from the committees onto action um, for a broader council discussion. Um, I will note that your action calendars are rather full. So, although this may be something that we think can move quickly, um, at this point, I believe your tentative agendas are full until April. Um, so I, I would need to ask uh, Director Bachelor on the impact of something like this in terms of that time frame. The other thing I would say is um, part of why staff brought this to the committee actually was to alleviate the need to put no, such I, I a large. That. No, yeah. understood. So I just want to state for the for the committee and for the public that's part of why we did bring this. Um, to try and expedite that to manage the council's calendar. So again, it is a, a, at the committee's discretion if you wish to recommend as part of your motion, despite it being a unanimous vote, that you would still prefer this item to be on the action calendar. Um, I just wanted to provide that additional context. And like I said, I would also need to check in with uh, the director on timing. So Dean, would there be any implications if it didn't hit the, uh, the council until April? You know, I... I should know that, but I don't know that. Um, I think that when we did the last amendment, as it is in the report portion of it, it's through February of 23 this year. But I don't remember if we did time extension on the amendment. I want to say that there's an amendment until May to keep hotline in place. Okay, so if we have a motion that recommends it go on action provided that um, it would not have a an impact on operations to do so, uh, then I'd be good with that. I'm kind of feeling the opposite, which is that uh, given that we're down, we have five journey linemen out of 20 in place. We're desperate for outside contractors. This work is critical. People are frustrated that they can't, the lines are going down and they're not, you know, fixed more quickly, I would rather see us put this on consent with adequate explanation as to why it rented. But but what Dean said is he believes that the current contract would continue through May and we wouldn't have any impact. <clears throat> and if we would have an impact, I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And I'm I'm I think I'm with Assistant City Manager no, no, no say on here. I mean, I think April is the earliest that we can get this agendized and just going off of practice that we've seen so far this this year no matter how brief we may think an item may be i think the minimum we've seen is one hour on any true action item and even that is pretty um i think would be a very fast action item for this for this council i i highlight the idea we're having a chance to vet it here tonight there will always be the option to be able to to pull it and if we do get it pulled um Council might be able to express interest in expediting that based on uh, Dean's thoughts on on May. So I'm fine with this continuing with with consent. I mean, it's it's definitely been a struggle to try to manage the agendas, especially like through through pre through pre council, especially just given how long it has taken us to get through agendas. So speaking as somebody who's gone through a lot of agenda management yes. over the years, uh, I think you're leaving out a uh, weed abatement and those sorts of perfunctory things. Well, yeah, that's, and I would put this in nearly that category. I don't anticipate that this would take an hour. Um, and I'd be willing to put money in that and I might be proven wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take the bet. Um, so um, now I, I will say that, and I, I'd be disinclined to do this, but a, a vote to not support that by one of the members of this committee means that it would necessarily go on agenda. So what I'd like to do is have us recommend that it would go on agenda provided there would be no significant impacts on operations.
And that still gives discretion the agenda planning process. It's a recommendation and a contingent recommendation. I'd, I'd, I'd accept that because given the alternative, it's going to go on action anyway. So, okay. I uh, grudgingly you. support that. We can't persuade you. Uh, I, I think it's appropriate for a $20 million contract to try to go on um, on the uh, action, even if it's an abbreviated discussion. I just, I, I think it's, uh, when we when we look at our roles and the importance of, public trust in what we're doing this is part of it mm -hmm. and it yeah it gets convenient inconvenient sometimes but uh that's the balance and if we erode that public trust uh, it comes back and bites us so that's that's my reason not because i want think that we have to discuss it and that i i think it's contentious um but for the reasons i stated and i, I do want to um just to add one other note, which is uh, FYI for, as, as Dean mentioned, this uh, trying to hire internally or find available uh, contractors with high voltage line workers is a real challenge. And that is why uh, this was one of the referrals last year of the SCAP ad hoc, which is to pursue legislation to uh, try to address this need and that of power supply engineers, the engineers above this level. And uh, I've been working for six months with uh, uh, primarily assembly member uh, Byrne staff and secondarily uh, Senator Becker's staff to try to get actually legislation through that will begin to feed this pipeline because this is a shortage that not only are we facing right now and the industry facing but as everybody is moving toward electrification this problem will be compounded and quickly and it has been in my mind <clears throat> the most overlooked choke point mm -hmm. and constraint mm -hmm. in all the climate goals that we're looking at if we don't have these people uh good luck implementing our plan well i'll see you and raise you i want to see us um, encouraging more Palo Alto kids to pursue trades. And if we could come up with a city program that incentivizes kids to become an apprentice, you know, whatever the same, that would be amazing. We need more paths out of Palo Alto, and this is one obvious one. Well, and it, a big part of the discussion is it's not only Palo Alto, but we look at uh, uh, more modest income communities. These are incredibly... Incredible jobs. And so I was shocked to understand that the power, uh, uh, the high voltage line workers who are not even actually needing an AA degree to do this, uh, make uh, more money than the power supply engineers, four-year degreed engineers, and uh, with overtime considerably more. These jobs are for journeymen in the range of 200 to $250,000 a year. Yeah for uh, demanding yeah. skilled work, but that does not require true higher education. Yeah. It is a phenomenal opportunity. And part of the problem is been a marketing uh, issue. And uh, that's part of what we're attempting to address is to, um, to build an awareness of what great career opportunities are in these positions. Okay, um, so my motion is that we, um, uh, recommend this go on agenda, provided that there are no impacts on operations to do so. Okay. Uh, Chair Bird, a member of the public did recently join the meeting. Oh, on great. Zoom. Do okay. you want to ask for the comments? That'd be fine. Okay, let's see if this person wants to. Okay. Okay. Motion, motion approve a recommendation for finance that we yes and approve it. Sorry. Uh, Chair, no request to speak. Okay. Um, sorry, uh, and clarify my motion is uh, a recommendation that we approve this uh, with those other contingencies. Uh, yes, Dean? Oh, no, go ahead and take your photo. No, we're, we're oh. just a procedure. So how do I get back to you, the three of you? Do well, I, uh, do I Justin, it won't be email? to us. It will be to through the city manager and, and then, to the 
uh, mayor and vice mayor right. who do the adjust setting. Right. No, I, I'm talking about if it has. Oh, okay. never mind. Yeah, 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 you're right. You, you would inform it. them yes. it's no problem or it's a problem. Then. Right. Good. Thank okay. you. Uh, okay. And yeah. then did you catch that motion or did you want some help with it? Um, is it the staff recommendation with um, the caveat that this recommendation go to council as an action item, um, provided that the it does not impact operations? Nailed it. Nailed it. Good if job. It does it would go on its end. If it has an, an, a, a, any operational implications, it would go to consent. Got it. All right. All in favor? Can we get a second? Sorry. Oh. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, sure. Second. Okay. All good? All in yeah, favor? Sure. Aye. Okay. And that concludes our items for tonight. Do we want to um, uh, briefly review upcoming agenda? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we do, obviously, as you discussed tonight, have a full agenda coming up on this March 21st, um, our next meeting. So in two weeks from now, um, Tuesday the 21st, we will be going over the gas and electric utilities. Um, we also have a contract that's in the works, uh, another utilities contract, uh, one of our commodity purchase contracts. Um, and then now the wastewater rates will carry forward so that the committee can review all three in full. Um, following that, we have a bit of a reprieve uh, <laughs> since we brought the utility rates so early. Uh, and what the committee is going to see is actually an email, if not already out, soon to be out from the clerk, polling on dates for May, actually, since we've been working offline with the committee members trying to figure out potential dates based on schedules. So we'll send out a narrowed poll to see your availability for those budget discussions in May. Um, again, those are typically about two and a half days worth of meetings, um, depending on how lengthy the committee's discussion is um, or how compact it may be. Um, so check your emails for those in, as they will be coming out from VIN. Um, but otherwise, we will see you in two weeks. And um, the first budget meetings of the Finance Committee are not the first week of May, I take it. So right now, looking at folks' calendars, the budgets are expected to be going to council on May 1st. When you say folks' calendars? Um, well, you had asked me to coordinate with some of the committee members since there were known um, scheduling due to personal right. commitments. I, I just don't recall coordinating with me. I have not. Okay. That's why we haven't. Uh, I have only gotten to some of them at you. Okay. Um, and so if we wanted to do daytime meetings, um, then the 5th is actually a odd but potentially viable option, which is a Friday. So it would be that Friday of the first week. Um, so uh, totally acknowledge that we haven't coordinated with all committee members on this yet. Um, and But that's the earliest. And the, the reason I just want to make sure you sure. knew, uh, the first Thursday of the month, um, and really the first and third, but most of all, the first right. is triple stack for me. Absolutely. Uh, Your first week and third week. Caltrain BCDC, ETA board meetings all on the same day. Yes. So, so for your calendar, we knew the first week and the third week are rough weeks. Um, of on a the month. Thursday. Yep. Got it. Um, so that has been factored. All right. I want to acknowledge that yeah. Greer teaches during the day, and that's a really serious, important thing. Uh, my work typically has me out at night. Um, so we may have calendars that are not super compatible, but I would love for Greer and I to put our heads together on what we did. Abide rather than have a third party who doesn't necessarily know where our flex points are come up with that decision. Absolutely. I think we might have some opportunities if that fifth works. Uh, I know it's a Friday, uh, but I do think possibly the 5th of May and the 9th of May will be two days that both of your schedules oops, can accommodate. Um, and it avoids the first and third <laughs> weeks as well for the church calendars. So uh, I think we might have found them based on folks's. Uh, personal commitments, which is great, uh, but we will send those out to folks um, to I check. I love for you not to put personal commitments. It sounds like I have to look after my, I don't know, my cat. Like, we work. work. Your mic. My mic. Oh. Yeah. I would love for you not to call those personal sure. commitments just as a matter of, um, you know, these are, many of us work for a living, and um, I don't want to characterize as like things where somehow, I don't know, 
we have professional commitments. I would call it that or, or career commitments or what have you. You know what I mean? Understood. Yeah. And, and Greer, I'm worried about you taking time off work, off school, um, on the fifth and the ninth. So, uh, if you're fine with that, then I can leave it alone. But if you are smitting a little bit over that, then I'd love us to just see if there's, a, you know, anything that would be better. Appreciating that it's quite a chess game and it's been hard to get to this point. I just want to, I'm trying to be deferential to your needs as a teacher, frankly. No, I, I appreciate it. I, I've talked to the staff. Okay. I will say no more. Thank you. All right. I think on that note, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thanks.